नमस्कार अ वॉर्म वेलकम टू वर्ल्ड न्यूज एंड इंडियन पर्सपेक्टिव ऑन ऑल इंडिया रेडियो दिस इज वी सी प्रमोद एंड विथ मी इज रेशमा तिवारी ब्रिंगिंग ग्लिम्स ऑफ द मेजर डिवेलपमेंट्स ऑफ द डे फ्रॉम अक्रॉस द ग्लोब ओवर द नेक्स्ट हाफ एन आवर वी शेल ब्रिंग यू द लेटेस्ट फ्रॉम द वर्ल्ड ऑफ पॉलिटिक्स इकोनॉमी स्पोर्ट्स एंटरटेनमेंट एंड मॉर द हेडलाइंस इंडिया क्रॉसेज द माइल स्टोन ऑफ एडमिनिस्ट्रिंग टू बिलियन कोविड वैक्सीन डोजेस WHO hails this as an evidence of the country's commitment to minimize the impact of the pandemic. Prime Minister Narendra Modi congratulates the nation. India to elect its new president on Monday. Sri Lankan presidential election to take place on Wednesday. US President Joe Biden welcomes UAE's recent free trade agreements signed with India and other nations. A cargo plane carrying 11 tons of weapons including landmines to Bangladesh crashes in Greece killing all eight people on board France evacuates over 14000 people threatened by wildfires in the southwest as fires also spread in Spain Croatia and Greece PV Sindhu wins the Singapore Open badminton title and in cricket England set a 260 run target for India in the third and final ODI at Old Trafford India on Sunday crossed the milestone of administering 2 billion doses of COVID-19 vaccine within 18 months of launching the vaccination drive in January last year. World Health Organization has hailed India for administering over 2 billion COVID-19 vaccine doses. Talking to AIR News WHO Regional Director for Southeast Asia Dr. Poonam Khetrapal Singh said this is yet another evidence of the country's commitment and efforts to minimize the impact of the ongoing pandemic. दो सौ करोड़ कोविड 19 वैक्सीन डोजेस देने के लिए मैं भारत को बधाई देती हूँ ये देश की प्रतिबद्धता और महामारी के प्रभाव को कम करने के प्रयासों का एक और सबूत है कोविड 19 टीके गंभीर बीमारी और मृत्यु से सुरक्षा प्रदान करते हैं इन जीवन रक्षक टीकों को सभी लोगों तक पहुँचाने के लिए हमें अपने प्रयास जारी रखने चाहिए Prime Minister Narendra Modi also congratulated all Indians on crossing the special figure of 200 crore covid vaccine doses. In a tweet Mr Modi said India has created history again. He said he is proud of those who contributed to making India's vaccination drive unparalleled in scale and speed. Mr Modi added that this has strengthened the global fight against covid-19. Health and Family Welfare Minister Dr Mansukh Mandavia said emphasis on scientific research manufacturing of covid vaccines and setting up a huge network for nationwide vaccination drive have played a key role in the speedy administration of 200 crore covid vaccine doses the nationwide covid vaccination drive began from the 16th of january last year and within a span of 18 months the country accomplished the significant milestone talking exclusively to all india radio news Dr Mansukh Mandavia said Prime Minister Narendra Modi's effective covid management is the main reason for the successful covid vaccination drive in the country Aaj Bharat 200 crore doses tika lagane ka vishwa ka sabse pehla desh bana hai Vaccine research se leke successful vaccination ye journey se hame ye prerna milti hai ki desh mein kabhi brain power aur man power ki kami nahi thi kshamtao ki kami nahi thi Dr Mandavia also highlighted the importance of Har Ghar Dastak campaign. He said continuous efforts were made to accelerate the pace and coverage of COVID vaccination. Talking about the recent decision of the government to administer free COVID precaution doses for people above 18 years of age starting from the 15th of this month for the next 75 days, the minister said this will help in boosting the immunity against COVID. All preparations are in place for the election of the 16th president of India on the first day of the monsoon session of the parliament on Monday. The polling will be held in the parliament house and the premises of the legislative legislative assemblies between 10 a.m. and 5 p.m. Draupadi Murmu is the NDA candidate while Yashwant Sinha is the opposition candidate for the presidential election. The total number of electors will be 4809 including 776 members of parliament and 4033 members of legislative assemblies. The counting will take place on the 21st of July. The term of office of President Ramnath Kovind is ending on the 24th of July. The Election Commission has appointed 37 observers for overseeing the arrangements of polling and counting during the elections. 
The Commission has deployed one observer for overseeing polling at each of the 30 places of poll in the state and UT legislative assemblies and two observers for Parliament House. The designated observers will take stock of election arrangements made for security and transportation of ballot boxes and election material by the returning officers and assistant returning officers and ensure free and fair elections. The observers deputed at Parliament House will also oversee the counting process of votes on the 21st of this month. Meanwhile, the ruling BJP has announced West Bengal Governor Jagdeep Dhankar as the BJP and the NDA's Vice Presidential Candidate of India. The decision was taken during the BJP Parliamentary Board meeting in New Delhi on Saturday. Making the announcement at the media briefing, BJP President J.P. Nadda said, Mr. Dhankar was born in a very humble family in an agrarian household in a remote village in Rajasthan's Junchunu district. He said Mr. Dhankar worked tirelessly to become a successful professional before entering public life. Prime Minister Narendra Modi said NDA Vice Presidential Candidate Jagdeep Dhankar is known for his humility. In a tweet, Mr. Modi said he brings an illustrious legal, legislative and gubernatorial ca career with him. On the other hand, Ms. Margaret Alva will be the opposition's candidate for vice presidential election, which will be held on the 6th of next month. Briefing media after the meeting of opposition parties in New Delhi today, NCP chief Sharad Pawar said 17 parties are on board for this unanimous decision. He said Mrs. Alva will file the domina nomination on Tuesday. Mrs. Alva has been member of Rajya Sabha four times and once of Lok Sabha. Ahead of the monsoon session, an all-party meeting called by the government was held in New Delhi on Sunday. It was convened to seek cooperation from all political parties for smooth conduct of both the Houses of Parliament. Briefing the media after the meeting, Parliamentary Affairs Minister Prahlad Joshi said members of 36 political parties took part in the meeting. 36 parties attended and almost 36 leaders, they put forth their views and I am thankful to them for having accepted our invitation and participated and they have given their suggestions also and they have demanded for some of the issues to be discussed. The government under the leadership of the entire meeting went on in the leadership of Sri Rajnath Singh Ji. Rajnath Singh Ji and myself, we have amply clarified that under the rules and the procedure for whichever the speaker and chairman gives the permission, government is ready to discuss the any issue. Rajya Sabha Chairman M. Venkaya Naidu chaired a meeting of floor leaders of different parties in the Upper House on Sunday evening ahead of monsoon session. The session will continue till 12th of August. There will be 18 sittings during the session. AIR correspondent reports that various bills including Family Course Amendment Bill, Forest Conservation Amendment Bill, Press and Registration of Periodicals Bills are likely to be taken up in the session. In today's hotspot section, we bring you a discussion on electing the new president of India. In conversation are Himanshu Roy, political analyst, and Ashwini Srivastava, journalist. Nearly 4,800 elected MPs and MLAs will vote on Monday, that is July 18, to elect the 15th President of India. National Democratic Alliance, that is NDA candidate Draupadi Murmu, who last served as Jharkhand Governor, seems to have a clear edge over opposition Yashwan Sinha as over 60% votes are expected to be cast in her favor. The polling will take place in Parliament House and state legislative assemblies for which ballot boxes have already reached their destination. The counting of votes will take place at Parliament House on July 21st and the next president will take oath on July 25th. Himanshu ji, please tell us about President's poll preparation and decode tomorrow's election for our listeners. Well, it's a well-concluded season that has been going on for the past two weeks and more that Mrs. Murmu, the NDA candidate, will be the next president of India. It's almost a foregone conclusion and therefore one after another since major parties are now supporting her. So the decision of the NDA well thought out and taken into account with the background while keeping in mind 
that the lady has been coming from a very poor background, the social background, the kind of a struggle she did for her education in Odisha, the kind of politics she did, and even as governor of Harkhand, the kind of uh, decisions she took. So that was all in her favor. And then the top leadership of the NDA and the BJP, uh, the way they chose a candidate. So it was a foregone conclusion that she is going to be the next president of India. And keeping in mind also the trend that the NDA has been picking up the candidates one after another. Earlier, President Kovind was elected as the president when he was chosen as the NDA candidate and now Mrs. Murmu. So this uh, whole procedure of voting tomorrow or day after tomorrow in the Rashtrapati Nivas, it's a question of how many votes he is going to get. And with the last, uh, except for this uh, Aam Aadmi Party, who has declared his, the party has declared its support for the opposition candidate, we find that most of the parties which were once upon a time with the opposition group have now shifted to the support of the NDA. And most of the political aware citizens of India know the voters, that's the members of the Lok Sabha, Raj Sabha, the Legislative Assembly, the Legislative Council, even in the different states of India. They all know that to whom they are going to vote. So the call of the opposition candidates to vote according to the consent itself reflects that the candidate is not winning. That's right. We'll talk about opposition candidate in a bit. But first about NDS nominee. You see, there were few names that were said to be doing the rounds for the president poll. What do you think NDA picked former Jharkhand governor, what was the reason? And here I would like to mention in if she wins, though number seems to be in her favor, if she wins, she is going to be the first Dalit woman president of the country. So has her candidature got something to do with caste politics? These two questions. See, uh, not Dalit, but uh, you can say tribe, uh, the first tribal candidate, uh, the first tribal president uh, of uh, republic, uh, number one. Number two, the only criteria was the last time a Dalit candidate was chosen by the NDA to be the president of India. So this time, since no one has been ever a tribal president and that to a woman tribal president, this was something, the novelty and the leadership of the BJP in particular, the way they choose the candidates very carefully, which has a symbolic value for the whole of the country as well as for the downtrodden, the subalterns, because these kind of personalities who are going to occupy the constitutional post inspire a lot many of the poor subaltern citizens who have been on the margin. So if Mrs. Murmu could do it as the tribal president of the country, so could many others be coming from the poor background. And in the last seven, eight years, if you notice that a lot many of the tribal people or the marginalized sections of the country have been getting Padmusri and Padmushan. Can we imagine or had we imagined that eight years ago such kind of people working in different parts of India quietly, unknowingly could come to the Republic in Delhi, come to the President's office and could be vested with Padmusri. Earlier it were the economic, political, educational elite who were bestowed with the Padmasri and the Padmushan. Now it's the poor. So that's a qualitative change in the vision, in the thinking of the BJP leadership. And the choice of Mrs. Murmu reflects that vision for this republic. Uh, let me briefly huh. tell our listener as to how a president is elected before we go further. The electoral college which re- elects the president through the system of proportional representation comprises huh. elected MPs and members of state legislative assemblies. Nominated Hmm. MPs and MLAs and members of legislative councils are not entitled to vote in this election. The value of vote of a member of parliament has gone down to 700 from 708 in this presidential poll due to the absence of a legislative assembly in Jammu and Kashmir. Similarly, in states, the value of vote of each MLA varies in different states. In Uttar Pradesh, the value of vote of each MLA stands at 208 
followed by 176 in Jharkhand and Tamil Nadu. In Maharashtra, it is 175. In Sikkim, the value of vote per MLA is 7, while it is 9 in Nagaland and 8 in Mizoram. Many people have question on their mind as to why opposition parties chose Sinha. Uh, you know, there were a few names that were being talked about. Opposition per camp had approached Gopal Krishna Gandhi, who is grandson of Mahatma Gandhi and a former governor of West Bengal. Then they also approached NCP Supremo Sharad Pawar and National Conference hmm. leader Farooq Abdullah to contest the hmm. They all declined. So why Sinha? See, there was no alternative. He was the candidate of TMC. Recently, he had joined TMC. He kept on changing the parties in the past one to two, three years, leaving the BJP, then joining some other parties, then joining TMC, etc. And the TMC uh, had suggested there were a couple of names, you know, you have already said that not to repeat again. They could easily calculate, they are veterans, they could easily calculate that they are going to lose. Kind of group majority that the NDA alliance enjoys the number. It's not a BJP dominant party only, but the way the BJP has been functioning at the national level, making alliances, not only in the parliament and in the central government, but even at different state levels. The way they cope the views of the opposition, the, the way they adapt to the changing situation. So they have acquired an aura, a dominance that once upon a time Congress had with the sleeping of the Congress grip over the politics and that's being replaced by the BJP. The leaders of the opposition, they could easily sense, they could easily view that once they declare their candidature, they are going to lose. Since Mr. Sinha was uh, chosen by the TMC leader, so he was bound to contest. He could not have said no, despite knowing that he is going to lose the election. But that's his fit. And that's the irony that the man who was once upon a time a cabinet minister was in the party. His son was in the ministry, is now on the margin. Right. The National Democratic Alliance nominee now has over 6.67 lakh votes after the support of various regional parties out of a total of 10,86,431 votes. So all eyes will be on tomorrow's election and results will be declared on July 21st. Siman Shuji, thank you so much for talking to us on tomorrow's president's election. Thank you. The 52nd BGB BSF Director General Level Border Conference started in Bangladesh on Sunday with the arrival of the Indian team led by DG of Border Security Force Pankaj Shah in Dhaka. On the inaugural day, the two sides discussed a wide range of issues related to border management, smuggling of arms and ammunition, drugs, trafficking of women and children and various developmental activities within the 150 yards of the international border. Discussion on the joint initiatives to implement the Coordinated Border Management Plan, CBMP, as well as exchange of information on various armed groups and extremist and terrorist organizations also took place during the conference. During the course of the conference, the Indian delegation will also visit Padma Bridge and Cox's Bazaar as part of strengthening bilateral relations and increasing goodwill between the two countries, said a press conference issued by the BGB. The conference will conclude on the 21st of this month with the signing of the joint record of discussions. India's Chief of Army Staff, General Manoj Pandey, has arrived in Dhaka on Sunday evening on a three-day visit to Bangladesh from the 18th to 20th of July. This is the first foreign visit of General Manoj Pandey since assumption as the Army Chief. He will begin his visit by paying tributes to the brave hearts who made the supreme sacrifice during the Liberation War of 1971 by laying a wreath at the Shikha Anirban on Monday. During the day, he will be carrying out multiple meetings with senior officials of the security establishment and exchange views on various defense-related issues. He will also pay tributes to the father of the nation, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman Memorial Museum in Dhanmondi. In India, BJP President J.P. Nadda held a meeting with former Nepal Prime Minister Pushpa K. Vihal Prachand in New Delhi on Sunday as part of the Know the BJP initiative. In a tweet, Mr. Nadda said they had 
fruitful discussions over strengthening and deepening ties between India and Nepal. They also discussed ways to further party-to-party -party cooperation. This is All India Radio giving you the world news. For quick news updates round the clock, follow us on Twitter at AIR News Alerts. Sri Lanka's acting president Ranil Vikramasinghe, main opposition leader Sajid Supreme Udasa are among the four candidates who have joined the race to become the country's next president. Lawmakers met on Saturday to, re to start the process of electing a new president to succeed Gotabaya Rajapaksa, who resigned after unprecedented protests against his government over the country's economic collapse. Besides Vikram Singh and Premadasa, Marxist JVP leader Anura Kumar Disanayake and D. Alaha Peronama are the other two leaders who have so far announced their candidacy to contest the July 20 vote in Parliament to succeed Rajapaksa for the rest of his term until November 2024. Parliament met for a brief special session on Saturday to announce a vacancy in the presidency following the resignation of Rajapaksa. During the 13-minute special session, Dhammika Dasanayake, Secretary General of Parliament, announced the vacancy for the post of president. Dasanayake said that nominations for the election of the new president will be heard on Tuesday and if there is more than one candidate, the lawmakers will vote on Wednesday. The 225-member parliament is dominated by Rajapaksa's ruling Sri Lanka Podujana Peramuna SLPP party. U.S. President Joe Biden has welcomed the United Arab Emirates' economic initiatives, including its recent free trade agreements signed with various countries, including India. According to the White House statement, Mr. Biden and UAE President Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nahyan met in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, in a bilateral meeting on Saturday during the summit of the United States and the Gulf Cooperation Council and Egypt, Iraq and Jordan. Speaking at the summit, Mr. Biden told leaders of the Gulf Cooperation Council that his administration would support relationships with nations that share similar interests as the United States. He also mentioned a plan to integrate the air defense systems of nations in the West Asia. President Biden added that the U.S. will not walk away and leave a vacuum to be filled by China, Russia or Iran. President Biden also asked Arab nations to increase crude oil production during the summit, but he did not receive an immediate response. After the talk, Saudi Arabia's foreign minister said only that the OPEC and its partners will continue to assess market conditions and do what is necessary. The OPEC plug groups of oil producing nations is expected to discuss whether to increase output at a meeting that is scheduled to be held early in August. A cargo plane which crashed in northern Greece was carrying 11 tons of weapons including landmines to Bangladesh, officials say. People living within 2 kilometers of the site where the Antonov 12 came down have been warned to stay indoors. The aircraft was flying from Serbia to Jordan when it crashed late on Saturday close to the city of Kavala, killing all eight people on board. Eyewitness videos showed the plane on fire and a huge fireball as it crashed. On Sunday morning, drones were being used to survey the site of the wreckage out of caution. Greek state-run TV reported the Army explosive experts and Greek Atomic Energy Commission staff would not approach the site until it was deemed safe. France has evacuated more than 14,000 people threatened by wildfires in the southwest as fires also spread in Spain, Croatia and Greece. We have a report. Authorities in France's Tirand, a popular tourist region, have evacuated guards from campsites. The tourists left earlier. Fires have spread in La Teste de Buc and Londihas areas. In southern Spain, more than 3,200 people fled fires in the Mijas Hills, though later some were able to return. Portugal's fires are contained for now. However, the Portuguese authorities say at least 238 people have died from the heat over the past week. Across the Mediterranean, from Morocco in the west to Crete in the east, thousands of firefighters and many water bombing aircraft have been deployed. Heat waves have become more frequent, more intense and last longer because of human-induced climate change. 
The world has already warmed by about 1.1 degree Celsius since the industrial era began and temperatures will keep rising unless governments around the world make steep cuts to carbon emissions. The French Weather Service has forecast temperatures of up to 41 degrees Celsius on Sunday and new heat records are predicted for Monday. In Portugal, the temperature recently reached 47 degrees Celsius. In the UK, there is an amber warning for extreme heat as the country braces for record temperatures on Monday and Tuesday possibly reaching 41 degrees Celsius in some parts. Some areas in southwest Turkey and on Croatia's Adriatic coast are also struggling with wildfires. In Italy, the government has declared a state of emergency in the desiccated Po Valley. The country's longest river is no more than a trickle in some places. News Desk, World News, All India Radio. Ace Indian shuttler PV Sindhu has clinched her maiden women's single title of Singapore Open Badminton Tournament. The two-time Olympic medalist defeated Wang Ji Yi of China 21-9, 11-21, 21-15 to claim her third title this year. She won Korea Open and Swiss Open earlier this year. Prime Minister Narendra Modi has congratulated Sindhu on the victory. In a tweet, Mr. Modi said she has yet again demonstrated her exceptional sporting talent and achieved success. He said it is a proud moment for the country and will also give inspiration to the upcoming players. In cricket, India beat England by five wickets and won the three-match one-day international series by 2-1 at Old Trafford in Manchester today. Chasing a target of 260 runs, India made 261 for the loss of five wickets in 42.1 overs. For India, Rishabh Pant, unbeaten on 125 runs, was the top scorer, while Hardik Pandya made 71 runs. Earlier put into bat, England were all out for 259 runs in 45.5 overs. For England, skipper Joss Butler top scored with 60 runs. All-rounder Hardik Pandya, in an economical spell of 7 overs, took 4 wickets, giving away only 24 runs, while Yuzavendra Chahil scalped 3 wickets. Now let's take a look at the major developments around the world as reported in the foreign press. First, we have a look at the press reports on China. Bloomberg reports more Chinese home buyers refuse to pay loans amid contagion fears. Home buyers have stopped mortgage payments in at least 100 projects in more than 50 cities as of Wednesday, according to Research China Real Estate Information Crop. PTI reports that Chinese President Xi Jinping has asked officials to step up efforts to uphold the principle that Islam in China must be Chinese in orientation and religions in the country should adapt to the socialist society being pursued by the ruling Communist Party of China. Xi visited the volatile Xinjiang region. Now let's have a look at the press reports on Nepal. The Kathmandu Post reports that Nepal is more closely on the brink of a new wave of COVID. Health experts say that exponential growth in infection may start within a few days. And a look at the press reports from Pakistan now. Don writes that Minister of for Railways and Aviation Khawaja Saad Rafiq on Saturday announced a reduction in fares of Pakistan International Airlines and Pakistan Railways following the recent cut in fuel prices. A look at the press reports from Bangladesh. The local Bangladeshi pharmaceutical company Globe Biotech Limited on Sunday received approval from the Directorate General of Drug Administration to conduct human trials of Bangavax, a single-dose COVID-19 vaccine, reports Dhaka Tribune. A quick look at the headlines once again. India crosses the milestone of administering 2 billion COVID vaccine doses. WHO hails it as an evidence of country's commitment to minimize the impact of the pandemic. Prime Minister Narendra Modi congratulates the nation. India to elect its new president on Monday. Sri Lankan presidential election to take place on Wednesday. US President Joe Biden welcomes UAE's recent free trade agreements signed with India and other nations. A cargo plane carrying 11 tons of weapon including landmines to Bangladesh crash, crashes in Greece. France evacuates over 14,000 people threatened by wildfires in the southwest as fires also spread in Spain, Croatia and Greece. PV Sindhu wins the Singapore Open badminton title and in cricket in India beat England by 5 wickets and won the ODI series by 2-1. And now before we end let's listen to Mahatma Gandhi's favorite bhajan Vaishnav Jan by artists from Philippines.
that, we end this bulletin. We'll be back at the same time tomorrow with the next edition of World News. Thank you.